Hey everyone, welcome to the second part of my chat with Peter Moore about how preaching transforms the hearer. Uh, in this part we'll get into the nitty gritty of his thesis. I actually recorded this a few years back because I've been trying to get this podcast going for a while. Um, so actually the first uh, four interviews that I'll be releasing on this channel are a bit old. But over those couple of years I've really become fascinated by preaching and what it is and how it works. So I'll do a few solo episodes in the near future where we'll dive into different aspects of preaching and I'll share my own thoughts on it. But what Pete shared in this interview was really fascinating and I think it gives a really helpful framework for how to understand uh, the act of preaching. So let's jump in. Yeah, but then God uses them both to heavily influence the church in following years and for hundreds of years following. That's it. Um, so let's let's start with that um, rhetorical training then. Um, so can you can you maybe give us a brief explanation about what uh, formal rhetorical method is that the word? Yeah, classic yeah. rhetoric. Yeah, uh, Cicero was a great first century Latin orator and he talked about the three levels of persuasion. And this is what orators in those days were taught. The first level of persuasion is teaching. Um, I won't give you the Latin words because it probably won't help you. <laughs> but teaching. Uh, so they were taught how to give clear presentations of ideas in their in their oratory their, their public speaking um, that's the first level of persuasion you need to have ideas clear ideas and for example um, one of the methods of gaining clarity which they taught their students was what they called antithesis or opposites so if you wanted to say what is um, a fresh green lawn and if you wanted people to understand what it meant for a lawn to be healthy and green, you could show people pictures of a dead lawn, which was all brown and, cr and crackled, or even just a dust bowl. And so you show what's healthy or what you're trying to teach by showing the opposite. And that helps people with clarity. And a lot of preachers today, they will say, well, this is the principle that we need in our life. Now, and that's what it might, here's an example of what that might look like in a lot of Christian life. And then they might give, and this is antithesis, and it's really helpful. What would a life look like that rejected that principle? Mm. And so that gives clarity as to what that principle really means. So clarity, teaching is the first level of persuasion. The second level of persuasion, which some orators said engaged the gentle emotions, was basically interesting or delighting people. Okay pleasing people so in order to be a successful public speaker i don't know whether we're doing this now ourselves john in our <laughs> podcast you've got to give people interesting things don't just drone on in the same voice all the time but have variety of voice and you know illustrations little dialogues and so forth so variety was the chief means of delighting people or keeping people interested engaging the gentle emotions humor for example comes in there so you might tell a little wit make a witty remark and that brings people back to what you're saying and it helps them listen to you so that's the second level of persuasion and the students were taught how to do that and the third level of persuasion is what they called moving a person or convicting a person mm -hmm. uh, really grabbing their heart and and orators talked about engaging the strong emotions which would be things like fear compassion mm -hmm anger and so when they come to the climax of their sermons or their oratory i suppose as classical pagan orators mm. they would become very passionate and there were orators that wrote about how to engage the emotions and in fact even to produce that same anger that same feeling of compassion that same fear mm. in the people you are preaching to us public speaking in the case of the pagans um and of course the way you do that primarily is displaying that emotion so whatever emotion you display as a public speaker 
Mm. The principle is that that the the people who hear you will be influenced by that, and that was the sort of training that these two preachers gained. So they were able to present ideas clearly. They were able to, and of course, for them as expository preachers, it would be the ideas that were being taught in the Bible. They were able to maintain people's interest through engaging the gentle emotions, Mm -hmm. curiosity, humour, that kind of thing. Um, And then they were able to actually convict people's hearts and grab their, you know, appeal to the strong emotions. And you see that particularly in Chrysostom, but also in Calvin in the closing parts of his sermons. So that was wonderful training for Christian preachers. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because, as you already mentioned, we are uh, in Protestant circles uh, who preach expositorily, yep. <laughs> uh, use expository preaching. Um, we have basically modelled our preaching style off Calvin. Uh, but I, I don't know what you think about this, but do you find that most preachers today in churches today, they really grasp that first level of rhetoric which is the teaching you said uh but less so engaging the soft emotions and then even less so engaging the strong sorry soft emotion gentle emotions and then even less the strong emotions um do you think we're kind of missing we're taking the um rhetorical style of preaching but not grasping at all and just kind of picking a, a smaller part of it i think that's a pretty fair comment i think In my training, I don't know whether this was really what my teachers in those in Moore College and at Christ College, I'm not sure if it was really what they were saying to me, but what I heard Mm. as a young man, as a student, was it was the ideas of scripture that were all important Mm. and the gospel, you know, the power of God for salvation to those who believe. Mm. That's from Romans 1. Um, And so I took that as being the idea of the gospel And I was even as a young pastor, um, and so I was ordained in 1991, um, that becoming emotional or engaging the emotions was actually unfaithful preaching because it was actually um, corrupting preaching. It was manipulating people with emotions. Mm. And so I actually tried to keep emotion out of my preaching. But what I came to see was that I was actually corrupting the truth because the truth is actually not just bare ideas. It's actually a personal encounter between God Mm. and humanity. The gospel is actually the story about Jesus. That is profoundly engaging to the emotion. It's personal. It's a personal encounter. Mm. And if in my attempt to not manipulate people or corrupt the truth, I actually corrupted it terribly Mm. by trying to evacuate the emotional content from it. It also made for really boring preaching. <laughs> and yeah. so I had to I had to learn. And I've partly it's been helpful for me to, to understand now, reading Calvin and Chrysostom, why it was that the theory, whether it was what I was taught or not, mm. the theory that I'd learned um, was so misplaced. And so if I'm going to be faithful to the truth, it will be to present Jesus as a person mm. and God as a person as the three threefold person, of course, a Trinitarian mm. God, to people to have actually have a personal encounter. And whenever you encounter a person, it's, it engages our whole being. It engages our thinking, our mm. feelings. And often if it's a person standing straight in front of us, it'll be a bodily thing. In fact, our emotions do impact us bodily, I think. Mm. So now I'm trying to follow more in the tradition of John Chrysostom mm. and John Calvin. Um, and be more faithful to the human and holistic nature of truth. So, so that would kind of imply that you yourself have to be touched emotionally as you're engaging with the passage before you can um, engage other people's emotions, gentle or strong, but particularly strong emotions. Um, if the, if, as you suggest, the prime way of doing that is to show those emotions yourself. Um, so how do you balance that um the idea of showing your emotions with um emotional manipulation from the pulpit because yeah. they're they're i guess maybe so 
going back to what you said about uh, in your training, you heard that the ideas, the actual exegesis or whatever is the important part. And I would say I, I heard the same thing in my training as well. Mm. Um, but when you uh, see some sermons that kind of push much more towards the emotional side and less the teaching side, um, that kind of doesn't feel right either. So how are you finding that balance for yourself between teaching and engaging the emotions? Thank you. That's a really great, great question. Um, in my thesis, I actually had the privilege of reading sermons by Chrysostom on 1 Corinthians 2 and also by Calvin on 1 Corinthians 2. And in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul actually talks about this by saying, you know, he didn't come to Corinth um, with persuasive words, um, but he came with the gospel in its power. And both Calvin and Chrysostom, of course, have been trained in persuasion. And so I thought it won't be interesting to read what they actually say as they, and they're expository preachers, so they're trying to deal with the text. Won't it be interesting to see what they say in their sermons? And so the, I don't know if you realise, but um, public speaking was so prized in the ancient world and even in the day of Calvin that people had skill in taking down public speaking, even extemporised public speaking, word for word. It was like a kind of form of shorthand of the day because people would then, it was an art form which people appreciated and they would read those extemporised speeches later in mm. our published um, of course, they didn't have printing presses in Chrysostom's day, but they did in Calvin's day. And so Calvin's sermons were published, but so were Chrysostom's. So some of these have been preserved and I was able to, those sermons on 1 Corinthians 2 have been preserved. Um, what they both say is that persuasion, and I guess they're thinking here of, and they actually talk in their sermons about public speaking that engages, you know, people's hearts and is sort of manipulative and entertaining. They both talk about entertaining people, tickling their ears, which is mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, stroking another metaphor for stroking people, making them feel good. Mm -hmm. um, they say you don't use persuasion as a substitute for the truth. It's not something that stands by itself. And they both interpret Paul as saying that when he came to Corinth, he didn't come to entertain people with public speaking. His only concern was to make plain the gospel. Mm. And Calvin and Chrysostom say, um, and that's still our concern. Now, we use classical rhetoric, they say, and pastors rightly use classical rhetoric to make plain the gospel, not to entertain people, but to help people have a true encounter with the truth, mm. the holistic truth of the gospel. So that's how they interpret it. And so if I can answer your question, we use emotion and we appeal to emotion in, in a faithful way that is true to the actual content of what we're preaching. And in order for people to actually hear and appropriate and, and process the content of what we're saying. So we don't evacuate the truth of, of the emotions because that they won't be able to properly hear it then, but we present it with its appropriate emotional content mm. and impacts on people. And as you rightly said, the main way I guess we do that is by, by experiencing that truth ourselves emotionally and then reflecting on, well, to what extent was that an appropriate emotional response I've just had to the gospel or to the truth I'm preaching this week? Mm. Okay, if that is an appropriate response, that's the response that I'm expecting and praying for. Um, in the people who listen. I think Calvin in his preaching, it's really interesting. He, he thinks about, well, what is the truth? Then he thinks about what will people feel, rightly feel, if they accept that truth and if they apply that truth in their life? Mm. And what will they wrongly feel if they reject that truth and refuse to apply it in their life? And then he talks about that. He talks mm -hmm. about what it would feel like to accept this and what would it feel like to reject this. And so he's, that's really deeply engaging people's emotions and exposing people's hearts. The heart, the emotions are a great mm 
great um, evidence of what's actually happening in people's inner world. Mm. I've heard it said it's not much of an indication of what's happening in your outer world. It's not in a much of a clue to objective truth outside of ourselves, but our emotions are a great clue to what's happening within and who we are. And so Calvin is wanting to for people to experience God in that inner life. And so he thinks about the emotional impacts. So I think that's my answer. Mm. Um, it's not much of an answer. You've still got to work it all out yourself. As a prisoner, <laughs> but what's an appropriate emotional response to this truth if I yeah. genuinely accept it? What would be mm. an inappropriate emotional response if I reject it? And that's basically the, mm. the clue to how to think about emotion in preaching. Right. So there's some there's some sort of vetting process for the emotions. Not all emotions are um, good to be engaged with at all times, but the right emotion at the right time, um, and that the kind of uh, criteria is found in the passage itself. The teaching portion of rhetoric um, should generate the emotional portion of it. That's it. Exactly right. And often you'll see the emotion anyway. Mm. Um, you know, Paul talks about you know I often did some, such and such. I'm thinking of Philippians here, I think. He says, with tears. Mm. And so he's, he, <laughs> that's not just a rhetorical statement. I mean, it is a rhetorical statement, <laughs> but it's not just a rhetorical statement. He genuinely, with tears, pleaded with people. Yeah. Um, and so that's account, giving an account of how he used and displayed emotion in his preaching. Right. Yeah. Um, so often the clues to the right emotions will be in the text if only we're willing to look for it mm. and not wanting to sanitise, if you like, the text and evacuate it of its emotion. Mm. So, so in 1 Corinthians 2, then, when Paul's saying, uh, I'm just concerned with preaching Christ crucified, it's, uh, it's, in the sen- it's not to the exclusion of emotions, but even the use of emotions is concerned with preaching Christ crucified. Exactly. Mm. I actually think, and there's debate about this, people that I really, really respect as historians and Bible readers claim that Paul does not use classical rhetorical techniques in his letters. But honestly, I don't get that that viewpoint at all. It is so obvious to me Mm. that he's using classical rhetorical techniques in his letters. Um, I think they're brim full of it. Um, so, <laughs> so you mean those markers of kind of like the teaching, the engaging, the soft emotions, engaging the strong emotions. Yep. They're yeah. all, yep. Um, a lot of the actual practical, you know, I don't know. I'm just making up a number now. If there's a 500 rhetorical techniques or a thousand rhetorical Texas techniques, there's a lot of them and you'll find them in Paul all through his letters. Mm, that's true. That's very true. Mm. Um, I've been going through Galatians in uh, Bible study, actually. And even in, in Galatians, which is kind of um, not in a bad way, but kind of one note, it's just going on about old covenant versus new covenant. Um, even in uh, a book like that, he uses a ton of techniques using metaphor. He's talking about his emotions, he's exaggerating, he's doing all these sorts of things. Um, and that's been really interesting to see as we've gone through in the Bible study, how he, um, really is saying the same thing over and over, but just with like, these different uh, techniques. Absolutely right. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> well, uh, this is my totally uninformed classical rhetoric opinion. I've got no idea about it, but it seems to me like, yes, he does use a lot of rhetorical techniques. All I've learned about classical rhetoric, I learned because of my thesis. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to, because I was trying to find evidence of Chrysostom's influence on Calvin's preaching, I had to fa- first face the fact, well, Chrysostom was trained in classical rhetoric. Calvin was trained in classical rhetoric. Mm. I might find similar things in their preaching, but maybe it's just because they've both learned classical rhetoric. So that was the starting point for my thesis. Mm. And so I had to really wrestle with what that is and read some handbooks myself and, you know, classical rhetorical handbooks and so forth and some texts. So it was a big learning journey. I think a lot of when you read something like a classical rhetorical technique, if it's ever going to stick and be helpful to you, it'll just be saying something that's really common sense anyway. Mm. Maybe you kind of were partly aware, kind of aware that that was 
a way that persuasion works. But the fact that they've been able to articulate it and bring it to your conscious awareness mm. helps you use that technique with more efficiency and more effect. Yeah. Um, but most of it's just common sense. Yeah. I mean, even those three layers of uh, persuasion that you mentioned before, like teaching, that's dead obvious, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then it only takes a moment of thought to realize, oh, yeah, soft emotions, strong emotions. I can see even not knowing exactly where that dividing line is between soft and strong emotions, I can kind of see um, that those are both useful in convincing and then thinking back on sermons that I've heard and maybe other speeches, you can see that the, uh, the ones that kind of grip you uh, tend to have the three of those maybe in the right proportion or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the preachers that I respect in our, kind of Australian evangelical expository preaching tradition are guys that do those three layers really well. Mm. And there's lots of them in, in our, you know, Sydney missionary and Bible college, Christ college, more college, probably more in college, mm. Australian college, um, college of ministries, these sorts of different places in Sydney. Mm. There's lots of really effective preachers and they're effective because they use those three layers levels of persuasion hmm. do you want to that are dead, dead dull and boring and it just <laughs> present ideas yeah. um but there are good preachers in our tradition which is great um do you want to throw out one for our listeners who might be interested in seeing how it's well, I, applied I like Ray, Ray Galea's preaching Ray okay. Galea yep. is a pastor an Anglican pastor in western Sydney he's one of my classmates at Moore College he is very a very fine Bible reader. He really reads the text well and explains the text well. Mm. He is an interesting preacher. He engages the gentle emotions really effectively. Mm. And he is a really compelling convictor. God, you know, he's given them given the ability to engage the strong emotions. Another example would be my current pastor, Craig Tucker at uh, Scott's church in at near Wynyard station in the city of Sydney. And uh, Craig is a very powerful uh, preacher. Um, I'm a probably I'm a sook, but most Sundays <laughs> when I hear Craig preach, I get tears in my eyes at some stage. He's not he doesn't present emotionally as a preacher, but he engages the gentle emotions because he's a really interesting preacher. But he also engages those strong emotions as well. Um, and he's a brilliant again, at like Ray, a wonderful reader of the text and present it with clarity, incredible clarity, the big idea. In fact, Craig has got this amazing ability to see what the big idea of a passage is and to doggedly stick to that and pound that into your brain <laughs> and into your heart. Uh, but with in a very winsome way, he's a very um, gracious and elegant preacher, I think. So yeah, be, examples. yeah I'll be interested to... Sorry, both, what was it? Both classmates of mine from Moore College, my year oh, at Moore right. College. Right. That wonderful. Yeah. Um, I agree with you about Ray. He's got a way of um, being firm without kind of crushing you. <laughs> and yeah. that's, um, that's kind of a, a hard balance to achieve. I'll be interested to listen to Craig Tucker as well after this. Yep. Um, and I'm guessing I already know your answer to this just based on how you're speaking about uh, classical rhetoric. But do you think that that's that model of preaching? Um, or sorry, the model of classical rhetoric applied to preaching is still a good way to preach in today's times. Yeah, I do. It's interesting. Um, I've explained how I had the privilege of reading Calvin's sermons on 1 Corinthians 2, which involved me having to read a, a, a Renaissance handwriting uh, manuscript which hasn't been ever published in TypeScript. It was really hard work. But once I I interpreted the scroll and read those sermons, they were just so beautifully Christ-focused, those sermons on 1 Corinthians 2. Um, So um, I think that classical rhetoric is enormously important and valuable for preachers today. Um, uh, I think we should we should train our students how to use these things. Calvin in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 2, actually, and the commentaries, of course, were addressed to pastors, 
his sermons were just addressed to the ordinary people of Geneva, but the, the commentaries were to pastors. He actually tackles this question, should we use the principles of classical rhetoric? And he actually says that these, because Calvin believes that all truth is God's truth, and if the pagans, these worshippers of Apollo and Zeus and other pagan deities, were able to understand how persuasion, human persuasion works, it's only because God, the true and living God, God the Spirit, had enabled them, not that they were indwelt by the Spirit, but, you know, the Spirit is in every part of the, of the world, and, you know, any good comes from God, God the Spirit. And so he says we should not spurn these good gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what he says about classical rhetoric. They've been given to the church by the Spirit himself, mm. and we shouldn't reject his gift. So mm. that's how strongly, that's a <laughs> powerful piece of rhetoric, isn't it, mm. um, in itself? And we shouldn't spurn God's gifts. I mean, how rude to throw back in God's face something that he's given us that's really useful for persuading mm. people about the gospel. Mm. And presumably not the only way or the only gift that we're given to persuade people or to teach people, uh, but one very useful and powerful one. That's right. And it's only in Calvin's mind and in my mind, it's only really useful when it's, or it's most useful when it's put in the employ of exposition of the scriptures and applying mm. the scriptures to people's lives. Mm. Um, let's in, in the second part of your PhD, you, you touch on specifically the emotions and the passions. So I feel like as in our church circles, anyway, we, we get the teaching part quite well. Um, but reading the second half of your thesis was really interesting about how Calvin and Chrysostom used emotions and passions. Um, could you take us through a couple of your thoughts on the use and the place of um, emotions? Within? Yeah. Yep. Actually, if you don't mind, I'm just going to rewind to an earlier chapter in my book. Hmm. That will make more sense of my answer once I've explained that to your mm. question now. Yep. So both uh, Chrysostom believes, I mean, some people have criticised John Chrysostom, this Greek preacher of the fourth century, as being a moralist mm. because he just talks about moral behaviours. He's very mm. interested in how we behave as Christians. And some people say, well, he's just a legalist. He's not really interested in the heart and in the inner life. Actually, that's complete rubbish. He is profoundly interested in the inner life. Cal Chrysostom has this concept the Greek word is nome, but um, we could translate it or interpret that as a chosen life's trajectory. Every person, every human being has a chosen life's trajectory. There is something that they're aiming for in their life. And for a Christian, that should be, of course, God and the glory of God and faithfulness to God. But for other people, um, it might be money or success or pleasure or whatever it is. I think even for Christians, our trajectory is not completely towards god and his glory um now the interesting thing oh, is sorry and, Peter, could you could you explain that's a really interesting thought um the christian is even for the christian it's not yeah yeah so our yeah if you think of a compass needle pointing and if you thought that north was god and his glory sometimes we're pointing to the east and sometimes to the west and maybe the northwest or the north east or the nor nor west we're getting pretty close to the north but there's always some you know there's sin sin is an ever-present right. principle in our lives and and we get distracted by other agendas mm. and i think you know most christians would be if they're self-aware would be aware that our motives are often very complex mm. we do want to please jesus but there's other things we're concerned about our own appearance how we look to other people, like I mean our pride, mm. do people admire us, do people respect us? What are people expecting of us? Mm. We try to make other people happy. So um, there's all sorts of other things other than due north where our compass points. Now, Chrysostom says all our superficial choices in life are based on our most profound choice, which is this chosen life's trajectory. Now, the interesting thing is how do we turn that needle point closer to north? what is the transformative moment that caused John or Peter in our cases to reorient our needle from maybe pleasure or pride or 
pursuing money or whatever it is when we became a Christian mm -hmm. and we reoriented our compass point towards God. And this is where it really gets interesting. Chrysostom says, as another person reveals to us their chosen life's trajectory, as they disclose which direction their compass point is pointing, that will have an impact on us. We will be encouraged to reorient our compass point towards that same goal in our life. And so as a Christian, as we do our evangelism or in our preaching, as we ex disclose to other people our passion for Christ and for his glory and the things of God in the world, as we show people from the heart what that looks like in practical terms in our lives, that will have a reorienting effect and a healthy transformative effect on other people. Mm -hmm. So whenever Chrysostom is preaching Paul, he'll talk about Paul's chosen life's trajectory. He'll say, you know, in Philippians 2, Paul talks about, you know, what he says in Philippians 2, and there's a number of wonderful things in that chapter, um, you know, the humiliation of Christ and the, the glorification of Christ and the, having the name above all other names and that we should be of like mind and that we should do everything in a way that will bring glory to Christ. He says that all in chapter two of Philippians. Um, Chrysostom says, well, why does Paul say those things? He always asks the question, not just what is being said, but why is it being said? And then he discloses in his preaching, Paul's chosen life trajectory. In the case of, you know, that Philippians 2 passage, it's about what Jesus did. It's about his chosen life's trajectory, which was to be a humble servant of the Father mm. and, um, and to bring life to us, I guess, as well, to serve others. Um, and as we have the chosen life's trajectory of Jesus disclosed to us or of Paul, um, that, that will have a transformative effect on us. And, um, okay, now... If that's the, and Calvin's got a very similar theory. He doesn't call it nome, which is a Greek word. He calls it voluntas. Calvin believes that transformation happens when we, by choice of will, choose to trust our, entrust our lives to the fatherly love of God. We believe in the fatherly love of God in Christ, and we're willing to reorient our lives to a life that is based on that confidence which will have you know profound impact on us so it's a similar idea to chrysostom it's not quite the same idea so here's in his preaching he's always disclosing god's what chrysostom would call god's nome or god's chosen life's trajectory right. which is to be a loving father to us in christ and for calvin that's the thing that has transformative power the power that is the gospel right so God's desire to love us as a father in Jesus in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And that has the, that's a kind of no may a chosen life's trajectory of the father yeah. through the son in the spirit. And as we, that's disclosed to us, the gospel, we, that has a powerful in transformative effect on us. Now, so could I, could I try and summarize that? If, yes, um, please do. So that'll help so, everyone. including me. <laughs> so for Chrysostom, Chrysostom, he uh, believes in each person's nome or chosen life's trajectory. Um, and the, the way that we change as people is to be exposed to the chosen life's trajectory of other people. Presumably some people's chosen life's trajectory influences us more than others for various reasons. Um, but then a feature of Chrysostom's preaching would be to expose us to Paul's chosen life's trajectory. Uh, if he was preaching one of Paul's letters. Uh, Calvin similarly thinks that each person has, could we call it a chosen life's trajectory? But he just uses the, the Latin word for it, which was... Voluntas. Voluntas. Um, uh, that each person's chosen life's trajectory sets us on a particular path. But the thing that really changes us is God's chosen life's trajectory. Um, in, if we're going to use those same terms uh, and then ex being exposed to that brings us more and more in line with God's chosen life's trajectory. 
And would he say other human chosen life's trajectories are then less influential? He would say that to the extent that your, John, your life discloses the gospel, that is that fatherly love of God in Christ, that that has power, that has transformative yeah. power. That is the power of God for salvation right. to those who believe. To the extent your life discloses that, yeah. and to the extent that your life contradicts that, that that will actually um, corrupt people and turn mm. people away from God. But it's always based on on the kind of the gospel, right? Critical, powerful thing, whether it's disclosed in a and preached from a, a letter in the Bible or from you know reflection on the life of a godly person yeah um it's the gospel the inner truth of the gospel that's the critical transformative thing which Mm. is this chosen life's trajectory of the father sending the son to die and rise for us Mm. and to show us love when we deserve to be rejected so it's some of calvin's really strong um beliefs in sovereignty coming through it's like even even the ex even being changed by another person's chosen life trajectory is God's work through that person. That's exactly uh, right. Right. Okay. And, and it's uh, all God's work. And they're doing that because it is God at work within them, both to will and to choose. Mm. Sorry, to choose and to do his good pleasure. That's supposedly another quote. I didn't quite get it right. But another <laughs> quote from Philippians. Mm. I expect to be interested in Philippians today. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I guess that that implies a really um high bar which the bible sets i guess a high bar for who we choose to be our um, preachers and ministers and elders in the churches um because i guess either in chrysostom's view or even in calvin's view the influence of their life on our life is quite profound yes Um, yeah right one of the great ones said and i can't remember who it is that's why i haven't named him (laughs) we can pass on what we know that we reproduce who we are. We can pass on what we, we know. We can pass on what we know, but we, reproduce. but we reproduce who we are. So who we are in, at that, in that inner life mm. is what we spawn, what gets spawned in others if we're a leader in a, in a workplace, mm. in a courtroom, in a hospital, or, of course, in a church. Mm. And so it's important. Now, the other thing that's important is that these pastors of ours, these leaders that we're following and that, that uh, we're going to be imitating, are actually able to be so secure in Jesus that they're willing to disclose their inner life to us. Mm. Because that's at the heart of Chrysostom and Calvin's method, isn't it? That they're disclosing to the sheep, as a mm. shepherd, they're disclosing to the sheep their inner love for God and their desire for his glory, Mm. their trust in the fatherly love of God, Calvin would say. Um, And so that private person, that kind of person that's not in touch with their emotions, that person who is fearful of disclosing who they truly are, not just the glorious bits like Jesus, but also the inglorious bits that are not so pretty. Mm. Um, As, as a, as a preacher discloses her brokenness or his brokenness to, to the women or men that are listening um, and discloses that as a person who grieves over it and who was wanting to be faithful to Jesus, Mm. that will have a profound impact on people as well. Mm. So Um, you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be, more or less orientated towards Jesus yeah, and or more or less trusting in the fatherly love of God and willing to be authentic in front of people. Mm. And then uh, kind of wrapping back to the emotions part, the having the right emotional response for um, what is being disclosed and how mm. accurately that follows um, God's chosen life's trajectory. Yeah. So, as I said before, you know, Calvin's interested in what it would feel like to accept and live a truth that he's Mm. expounding and what it would feel like, what are the emotions involved in rejecting it. He's aware that emotions, and this is the second half of my thesis, and this is the answer to your question from about (laughs) 15 minutes ago, um, 
emotions can either distract us from that trajectory towards God or it can reinforce that trajectory. And he's wanting people to be self-aware of that. He's wanting to be aware of that himself as a preacher. And so not to be naive and clumsy and inefficient, but to be thoughtful and skillful in helping people deal with the emotions that distract them from following Jesus, like fear, unbelief, um, uh, maybe bitterness, maybe um, a lack of forgiveness. Uh, uh, to be aware of those and the dangers associated with those. And then he's wanting also for people to be aware of the things um, that the emotions that will bring them a more in alignment with Jesus, kindness, brotherly affection, mm. um, compassion, um, humility, a sense of humility about our own weakness, um, those sorts of things. Willingness, a willingness to disclose that to others and to be real real with God and real with others in helpful ways. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to, I'm not encouraging you, anyone here to who's listening to vomit all their inner <laughs> life on every person they know. Um, and it's tricky as a pastoral leader, you need to learn or a preacher, you need to learn how to be helpful in what you disclose, but you must disclose. You can't be private. It just doesn't work effectively as a Christian leader. Mm. Um, that, that leads us into the topic of emotions quite well then. Um, where did Calvin and Chrysostom find the place for those types of emotions and revealing of the self uh, in their own preaching? I think we've already touched on the answer to this. So they, they were both passionate men. And so they were not, I mean, sometimes Calvin... I read some things written about John Calvin. Now, he did write the Institutes. And in the 16th century, it was the most articulate and thoughtful and logical presentation of Protestant thought. And so people have focused on him that have thought, well, he was only an intellectualist, logical, sort of robot kind of figure. And also people, because of some of his ideas, they assume that he was a nasty guy who had these logical principles which crushed people. Mm. Um, some people find the doctrine of election or predestination a logical, logically sound but unthinkable because it's just too cruel or something. Mm. So they assume that he was some cruel, nasty person. But you could only think that if you didn't read his sermons. He's actually a passionate... He's French! Of course <laughs> he's in touch with his emotions. He's a Frenchman. And um, and to think that he was anything but emotional is ridiculous. Um, so he's, he is a passionate Christian himself. He wears his heart on his sleeve in helpful ways. And, um, and we, this is what we touched on before. He first processes the truth for his, its own personal impact himself. It's really interesting. If you read his sermons, he never uses the French word for you. He never addresses people as you. The mm. only time he uses the word you is when he's quoting, he's reading out the Bible and that the word you is used in the Bible. He always says I or we or us. Mm. He always puts himself alongside his congregation. Now, Chrysostom, interestingly, uses the word you a lot, but never Calvin. Calvin sees himself as a sheep, first of all, and then a shepherd. Mm. And he he feels he has processed the truth himself emotionally and then he's standing beside people if i can use a spatial metaphor he stands beside people and shares with them how that's impacting him hmm. and how that should impact us rather than telling people what they should think or feel hmm. uh, which side of the fence would you fall on would you be a bit more chrysostom in saying Do I say you i try yeah. not to. I try not to. Yep. I think, um, why does Chrysostom use the word you and not Calvin? Calvin doesn't, partly because for most of his preaching ministry in Geneva, his congregation does not like him. Mm. And if they start 
because he's hated because he's he they didn't want to be disciplined they didn't want to be earnest christians they didn't want to be at the forefront of the protestant cause um particularly they didn't like the fact that there were all these refugees from france in geneva which was changing their city into more of a French city than a Swiss city. So it was the refugees. So they, were, they weren't boat people, but they were refugees mm. and asylum seekers. Mm. And, and John Calvin was passionately in favour of asylum seekers and he wanted to support these people. And so that was one of the main reasons they didn't like him. Um, Cal, Chrysostom, on the other hand, was always loved by his congregation. And so if Calvin started to say you as a guy they didn't like, he would, they would see his wagging finger and re- they wouldn't listen to a word he said. Whereas Chrysostom, who they were absolutely besotted with in Antioch and in Constantinople, they loved him so much. If he said you, they would listen very intently to what their beloved pastor was telling them. Right. And so, so um, I think in both cultures, authority figures were respected. But it just happened that in Calvin, for the first 15 years of his ministry, he was not respected. It was only when they finally realised what a man he was and the Protestant cause had succeeded in Geneva that he was much loved. Right. So there's a very, um, you have to be contextually aware of how you use, uh, I guess that was the pronoun you, uh, but probably of how you use emotions as well in preaching. Um, So though... Chrysostom can get away with you. Calvin maybe couldn't get away with you. Yeah. Um, and maybe if Calvin could get away with strong uh, kind of, what's the word? Uh, fervent emotions, f- particular emotions. Yep. Um, perhaps in different a different context, you can't. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if, coming back to the question, how where do I stand? <laughs> I try to stay with Calvin. I don't have the confidence... Uh, maybe it's I'm insecure or something. I'd rather put myself beside people rather than stand over them and tell them what to think and feel. Mm. I'd rather stand beside them and share with them how I think we probably should think and probably should feel. A bit more tentative, a bit more egalitarian. I think we're very egalitarian in Australia too, aren't we? Yeah, I think that's... Like people telling us what to do. Yeah. So culturally that's probably going to work better to stand beside people. The Calvin... The, the way Calvin frames his preaching is probably more culturally helpful in Australia, I think. I think um, preachers generally have a bad reputation in Australia. We've got a, it's, being Christian has a bad hmm. reputation in Australia. Hmm. And so we, we shouldn't be expecting that people will just do what we think or, or say uh, just because we've said it. Um, that probably won't work in our context. Hmm. So we've been talking about preachers a lot now and how Chrysostom preached and how uh, Calvin preached. Um, what are your thoughts on how this should influence um, us as also listeners and us as people who sit under sermons and under preachers? Um, does this understanding of rhetoric help us to be better hearers? I think it does. Now, for one thing, it helps us if we're being manipulated. Hmm. If you're aware that there has to be the three levels, it's it's good to have an idea. The thoughts, the ideas are important. Um, the gentle emotions do help us to pay attention. And if a preacher's not very good at that, then it's helpful to be aware of that and, and say, okay, this, this person, they're doing their best, but they're not really engaging me. However, I've got a duty as a listener to not just be a pawn um, and to be passive but maybe I need to do invest some of the interest, um, the effort, the emotional effort in to make up for that deficit. And then um, when it comes to the strong emotions, we also need to be thinking about what sort of emotional impact this truth ought to really, honestly, if I believe this, what's being told to me in the scriptures here, what emotional impact should that have on me? Now, hopefully the preacher's doing that work as part of his or her preparation and I don't have to do all the thinking um, but if they if they're not able to do that if they're not accurate in doing that on this occasion then we should be thinking about that because I think 
we're only going to adopt an idea that really does impact us emotionally. It has to be a holistic impact. Um, so as listeners, I think we can, we can work alongside the preacher mm. in their strengths and weaknesses mm. and fill in some of the, maybe some of the gaps. Yeah. It's... Most of all, I don't want to be manipulated emotionally without the content being true. And I don't want to be simply a person who goes away with a new idea, which doesn't change my heart. So mm. they're the two basic things that I'd be wanting to do as a listener. Yeah. So avoiding the two, yeah, avoiding the two extremes of uh, being taken in by emotion without uh, good teaching underneath it, and then um, being taught well but not engaged in any deeper level to move you towards God's chosen life's trajectory. Yeah, very good. <laughs> we want the head and the heart, mm. as you say, and in service of that trajectory towards loving and serving Jesus. Mm. Um, and what are your thoughts then about how this might influence um, how we search for uh, pastors? So my, my church is in the middle of looking for a pastor Ooh. at the moment. Um, okay. So this is more a topical thing for me, but how, how do you think this should does the does the pastor have to be a good preacher? Um, he has to be an engaging preacher in some way. Now, there's always going to be a range of skill sets, and I think if you're you're in a church of a thousand, you probably need a preacher who could speak on a platform somewhere like Katoomba Christian Convention or mm. CMS Summer School or something up in the mountains. Uh, in a smaller church of maybe 50 to, or to 100, you don't need a person with that same skill set, mm. but you need somebody who still can engage. Now, the way you engage a group of 50 is quite different to the way you engage a 1,000. It won't be so much with polished oratory. In fact, in a group of 50, that will look rather odd. <laughs> It'll be more through your personal, in, personal relationship with each of those people. Mm. And so I've been in churches where the pastor's not that gifted as a communicator, but they understand the truth, they have articulated the truth, and they're presenting it in a way that does engage me because I know who that guy is. Mm. I know he loves me. I know his personal life. And if there are inadequacies in the sermon, they're made up for the communication that he, which is speaking volumes, because I have a close access to him as a person in a small church. Mm. I can see the gospel as well as hear it. Um, so I think the importance of the, the kind of pulpiteering mm. as a performance, as, a, as a, a moment, is more and more important strategically depending on the size of the church. The bigger the church, the more important that moment is. Mm. And in really big churches of two or 3,000, probably the only important thing the, the pastor does every week is write and deliver the sermon. Mm. Um, but in smaller churches, it's a lot more complex than that. It would be wrong for him to spend as much time on his sermon. He needs to invest himself in other places. And that's probably why his preaching's not as good because he doesn't have the luxury of spending four days writing a sermon. Mm. He might only have a day or even half a day, depending on what's been happening that week mm. to write a sermon. Uh, so I would want a guy who can read the Bible, who can understand the Bible. I would think it's helpful if he can understand the big idea of passage. Now, I think you're a graduate of Sydney Missionary and Bible College, yep. John, and I teach there myself. And one of our things at SNBC is big idea preaching, and that's come down to us from the, that brilliant preacher, David Cook. Mm. And um, I think to have a big idea, holds your sermon together is really helpful. Now, interestingly, that is not true of Chrysostom at all. He's not a big idea preacher. Mm. He will just give you the ideas, the successive ideas in the passage, um, and then he will apply the final idea that he got to. Calvin's a bit the same. Mm. It might be a couple of ideas. And, you know, the interesting thing with Calvin is to read the next, beginning of the next sermon. Because at the beginning of the next sermon, he will tell you what the big idea of was of the previous sermon. As right. he, he, he recaps on the last sermon, mm. 
one of the things that he's just he like did, a good TV show. Yeah. One of the things he did when he got back to Geneva in 1542, four years after he'd been exiled from Geneva, was he said, now in my previous sermon, he recapped on the previous sermon, <laughs> which was four years earlier. <laughs> They'll definitely need that recap. Yeah. And he says, now in the next verses, and so that's incredible. He was basically saying to them, you got rid of me four years ago, but I'm back and I'm going to do exactly what I did when I was here yeah. four years ago. It's business <laughs> as usual. Um, but anyway, he does tell you in that first few moments mm. of the next sermon what his previous sermon was about. So that's where you find out what the big idea is. It's often hard to work out by reading the sermon itself, right. but you work it out when you read the next, beginning of the next one. Because he preached, you know, successive sermons through a, bo a Bible book, which mm. is you know, a common practice in our churches now. Um, so I would want my preacher to be able to work out and articulate what the idea of his sermon was. If he can't articulate, maybe he doesn't have any idea about what he's <laughs> saying. And that would drive me mad, I think, as a person in the church. But as long as there was a big idea, I, depending on the size of the church, I would be happy for an appropriate level of, mm. of preaching skill. I would put myself as a six or seven out of 10 preacher. I'm definitely not an eight or nine out of 10 preacher. I'm, mm. I've never been on a platform or anything like that. Um, I haven't had, I mean, for a lot of my ministry, I was pastoring two or 300 people by myself mm. and without any other paid staff. And so I didn't have time to spend two days a week writing a really top notch sermon. I had maybe six hours. Wow. And so you do your best that you can and people accept if there is, if you are trying to say something and it is coherent, mm -hmm. people will generally accept it and they know and love you. They, will, they People want to, to listen to their, their pastor if they, mm -hmm. all, it's if, if it's at all possible. Yeah. That's the kind of importance of the, of the chosen life trajectory of the pastor and how that, just exposure to that, whether it's in preaching or whether it's in day-to-day -day interactions, that's, that is a bigger driver of change it or is. it can be a bigger driver of change. Particularly in the smaller church mm. or even the two or 300 size church where people still have some access to you. If there was a church of 2000, I don't think that's as mm. relevant, mm. but they call in, in church size theory, they call that pastor of the 2000 size church the legendary pastor. <laughs> and the reason he's a legend pastor is because there's all these stories in the church of when the church was smaller and people had coffee with the pastor and the mm. sorts of things he said. So there's these legends about <laughs> having interactions with him, but nobody ever does anymore. <laughs> you know, the church has got 2,000 people and he's on an international stage. He's a jet setter who goes around the world telling people how to grow mega churches and the like. <laughs> but he still comes back and he preaches his... Yeah, his crack sermons. Yeah, and uh, the myth of him is still around. And the myth remains. That's it. <laughs> um, that's really helpful to think about um, the the different needs at different levels of churches, and so it's the the pastor to suit that. Thinking of the pastor to suit that particular church, not um, a dream pastor that might or might never come by, and might or might not even exist. And whatever pastor you choose. Um, he has to reinvent himself mm. when he arrives because you have to reinvent yourself for every church. You mm. can't just do what you did at the last church. Mm. In fact, you have to reinvent yourself as a pastor and as a preacher, which is more close to our topic um, today. Mm. You have to re reinvent yourself every three to five years because the world's changing mm. and your church is changing. Mm. So one of the things I do in my current ministry, you know, I train uh, mentors and coaches and I do mentoring myself as I'm helping Christian leaders reinvent themselves mm. because mm. you have to, you have to keep doing it. You've got to keep growing and yeah. changing because the world's changing. It's a and hard process. It is, yeah. but it's exciting. I think most of us get motivated when we feel that our skills are improving mm. and um, I'm in the business of motiv motivating people by helping them improve their skills. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, just keep an eye on time. I need, know you need to go soon. Do you want to tell us a little bit about 
uh, that sort of area of your life as we finish off, like how people can contact you, what you do for mentoring and what you're doing kind Thank of outside you. of that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. People can contact me. If you Google me, Peter C for Charles, it is more. If you put in Calvin and Chrysostom, I would imagine in Google, my photo will come up in the images <laughs> and my possibly my LinkedIn profile will come up. Um, and you could probably contact me through LinkedIn. Um, I have a business called Idifica. I better spell that for people. A E D I F I C A I D I F I C A. And it means edify in Latin. Um, you've got to have a business name. Anyway, if you put idifica.com.au, you'll see me uh, on the internet. Or if you put, if you send an email to peter at idifica.com.au, uh, that will come to me and I'd be happy to hear from people. Uh, so my main three days a week, I spend sitting with Christian leaders, uh, mentoring them or coaching them. Um, it's more like a holistic life coaching model, mentoring. Um, Christian mentoring, I think, fits within disciple making. You know, we're all called to be disciples and to make disciples. That's the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And I think um, mentoring fits within that broad theological framework. And so I'm doing that. I'm helping Christian leaders in their journey as a growing disciple who more and more is observing all that Jesus has commanded. Um, so I help people with that. I te teach leadership through a ministry called Oilstone, O-I-L-S-T-O-N-E. You could Google that if you like, and you'll find that that's a partnership. My, my mentoring ministry is a partnership with my wife, Nairi. The Oilstone is a partnership with a uh, Australian um, Christian leader called Michael Lin, L-I-N. Uh, we run these one-week residential training programs for leaders. And then I also work for Geneva Push and Reach Australia and supervising coaches. So you could probably, if you put Peter at the Geneva push.com, that would come to me as well. Mm. Well, wow, you're super busy. Uh, <laughs> no wonder you need to run off straight after this. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time, Pete. And thank you for sharing all the stuff that you've learned. That's only a small reading through your PhD that what we've discussed is only a small drop of, um, what's in it so thank you for boiling a lot of interesting stuff down for us and sharing it with us um i'll just finish off with a final question um how did the writing of this phd um, influence you now in your christian life um uh, or in your relationship with god in general okay i think for the i mean i was just my soul was ministered to every time i read a homily of these two men they are such Christ-honouring, Christ-focused preachers, gospel-centred preachers. And, you know, I mentioned those sermons from 1 Corinthians 2. When I translated those two sermons of Calvin's on those first five or so verses of 1 Corinthians 2, knowing that nobody had read those sermons for 450 years and to have read them myself and just the, just the pastoral love of Calvin for people just to trust in the fatherly love of God in those two sermons was just beautiful across the centuries. Um, so just the personal ministry of Christ and his gospel through their preaching did an enormous good. I think this concept of a chosen life's trajectory has really encouraged me to do more self-disclosure as a Christian and to disclose my, my, the things that really matter to me as a Christian, my core values and my love for Jesus. I think I don't know whether it's my Australianness, but I don't take myself very seriously. And I don't think most, most of us, we don't take ourselves very seriously as Aussies, do we, John? But, um, but God takes us much more seriously than we do. And other people take us more seriously than we do. Mm. And so I was encouraged by this concept of a chosen life's trajectory and that just being disclosed um, that I'm more willing now um, very aware of my brokenness, but to disclose my heart to other people. Um, I think I was brought up in a family where we were fairly private. Um, I am an extrovert, so I love being with people, but I wouldn't normally talk about myself, but I'm more willing to disclose that part of my life anyway, my heart for Jesus. Um, the other thing, of course, is what I'd sort of 
more and more been aware of as a preacher made so much more sense to me when I realised the importance of emotions in preaching. And so that was a significant moment for me in my preaching uh, career. Um, so they'd be the three big things, I think, and it, it was a wonderful experience. I think it was a, every, I enjoyed the whole experience of doing my PhD. Maybe 10 minutes were painful <laughs> in that six years of study. Um, it was a wonderful experience with some wonderful people, my supervisors, uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart Piggin was my, my senior supervisor at Macquarie Uni and he was just wonderful. Um, so I particularly appreciated him, but uh, the, uh, my associate supervisor and other folk that I, that supported me were wonderful too. Macquarie University Ancient History Department was great. So thank you for, that was my baby that I hatched over six years. So thank you for showing an interest in my ugly little baby. Uh, not ugly at all. Not ugly at all. Um, yeah, no, it was a delight to have you on and I feel like I've learned a lot in this chat and reading through the thesis as well myself. So thanks for spending your time with us. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. That's it. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to that interview. I certainly loved uh, chatting to Pete about that stuff. I think it gave us lots to mull over um, as both preachers and hearers. And I hope that helps to push your theology, your understanding of God in new and interesting ways. So details to find Pete online um, are in the links below and I'll catch you next time.